At the pinnacle of his power, a man risks losing control. The world is not kind, so its king has become cruel. Murder is never mercy, it's never noble, and it's never redeemable. To the maniac, murder is an art form. Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live. It's Monday the 6th, and I'm joined today by a producer, writer, director, jack of all trades in the earlier parts of his career, Mr. Aaron B. Kuntz. Now, you may know his work uh, in recent years from uh, either Scare Package, which was recently featured on The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs, or maybe you know uh, Camera Obscura or Starry Eyes. As a director, he, Camera Obscura and Scare Package are his most recent works where he is about to release a film called Pale Door, which is a horror Western. And uh, I'm very, very honored to be joined by Aaron. How are you, sir? Hey, that was a very nice intro, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for getting back in touch with me um, in these wild, woolly days of uh, pandemic and everything being in motion in everyone's life, and yet us all being very, very still at the same time. You never know who's game to just talk talk the horror business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been talking a lot, but uh, but I've enjoyed it. I mean, it's. I was joking with a friend earlier about how, yep, I'm on again talking about movies again, but uh, that's that's my life, and I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Well, it has been your life for quite a long time now. And uh, looking over your, over your resume, I mean, you are not exclusively a horror guy, but you've played in the horror sandbox a whole, whole lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, look, it, it made sense for me to kind of move into horror. It was just something where I had, I had some friends that I graduated film school with, and they kind of made the name in horror. And, and it was something that I always kind of wanted to do, and I'm the hugest horror fan at heart. So I knew there was, I thought there was an opportunity there. Plus you don't really need a lot of stars to make horror films. And I didn't know any stars. So <laughs> like, okay, maybe there's a way that I can, I can do that. So, uh, and then also you read about all of these other directors that started out making horror films. I was like, okay, well that makes sense. But I'm a cinephile first and foremost probably, but horror is at the core of all that. Well, don't you feel that if you, if you have a love of cinema in general, it's almost impossible not to be a horror fan be, because if you look at the fundamentals of cinema, the 30s Universal films really exploded the number of theaters. There was there's theaters that literally opened at 31 just to show Dracula and then Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah, completely. Completely. The, imp the impact of the horror genre throughout the ages. And during the lean years, it kept studios alive. It expanded the footprint into the ethnic neighborhoods that otherwise weren't getting movie theaters built. Horror has been a driving force for the industry. Yeah, well, it also completely changed the, the VHS and, and, and home video market, right? Like that really was a horror-centric thing. That's what kind of blew that up. And then streaming, which some can argue is the new VHS option, right? I think it's kind of like come out of the forefront out of that. So look, yeah, I think, I think people, look, there was this whole idea of trying to make horror like B movies and they're always below something and that's what it was. And even when I was raised, I wasn't allowed to watch horror films and my mom told me that these aren't for us and, you know, and they're not real movies and bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. But, um, but then, you know, cause as a kid, like you watch the thing and you're like, Oh, that's a really cool movie with that dog that turns into a creature. But then you start to really understand what the thing is all about and it's brilliant and it has a social political commentary and there's things that are undercurrent there that exist for us to explore. And, and I think that, you know, horror is a reflection of our times today. It's a reflection of what's going on in society, what's going on, you know, politically, what's going on, everywhere and our hopes and our fears. And I can go on forever about the validity of horror if that's what you need to do. So, but yes, I agree. <laughs> yep, the the genre at its basis is stories about mortality and morality and what mm -hmm. else is what else is fiction? I mean, it, it comes down to that no matter what you're gonna say. 
Yeah. But so how did you first get into horror? Obviously, it's, it's been a part, a large part of your both your professional life and from the sounds of it, your personal life. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, God, I mean, so I, my, I, again, I wasn't allowed to watch horror films, but my grandmother got HBO for free. Somehow, like the channel came through on our TV. And I used to have to go to her house after school every day. And this is when I was in grade school. Um, and I would bring VHS tapes. I put them on that like SVHS, SVHS kind of setting. And I would record overnight. And, and during those times, you know, we're talking like, you know, late 80s, early 90s, HBO really was not a, they didn't play our movies or horror movies during the day. They only played them overnight. So that's when the, the, those movies kind of came out. So that's, that's what I would see. That's what came out on those tapes. So that became my education and I just fell in love with it. Plus I loved movies, you know, and, and some of the movies I, I think my favorites were even like Beetlejuice and stuff like that. And um, Big Trouble Little China and some, and some, you know, then I also love sports movies. That's a different thing altogether. But, uh, but I love these things. And when I watched a horror film, like I didn't know movies could be like that. Like I, didn't, I had no idea that, you know, Alien and The Shining, which was one of those movies to watch at like 11 years old is a weird movie, by the way. And, uh, you know, all this stuff, I didn't know how it could feel that way. I didn't know you could be that exhilarated watching a movie and it excited me. So I just, every day I brought in a new tape. I would record them. I kept buying tapes. And then one of my good friends, Sean Talley, who's actually one of my producers at Paper Street, was a producer on Scare Package. I've known him since we met on the bus in seventh grade. <laughs> uh, but like that dude would give me tapes of movies to watch and stuff, you know, and all this. And uh, it just, it just like grew this love for something because I wasn't allowed to have it, so I had to have it. You know, it was forbidden fruit. Yeah, and I would say that it's funny. I grew up more uh, with the broadcast television premieres of movies, horror movies from the 70s in the very early 80s. And then when VHS hit, it was like flood doors just opened. Yeah. And, you know, when it's been quoted a lot from Stephen King and Dance Macabre. Whereas he says that if you love horror movies, you have to love a certain amount of crap. And I'm certainly guilty of that. But there's a debate in the community about whether we should call those guilty pleasures or not because people say they don't feel guilty. My thing is feeling guilty is part of the fun. It's kind of that outlaw like I shouldn't really be watching this or they shouldn't really have made this as part of the fun of the whole deal. No, no, actually. Uh, so we have a podcast as well. So my company, Paper Street Pictures, we have a little podcast in. Uh, Sean, reference again, who's on that podcast, I always tell them, like, don't call them guilty pleasure films. Just, like, enjoy the fact that you enjoy it, right? It's, you enjoy it. It is what it is. But it's still fine to have that inner sense of, like, eh, shit. Like, this is <laughs> as good as I think it is, you know, or whatever. But that's okay. Like, it's your taste, and you should own it and embrace that. But, but there was this connotation for the longest time that if it was horror, it was beneath all of our cinema. And that is something. And that's why the term elevated genre came out and all this and and when we were making Scare Package at the beginning, that was a big part of that conversation where it was, look, if we're going to kind of poke fun at horror at times, we cannot do this from a place of punching down or making fun of. It needs to be like bear hugging it at the same time and loving it. And, and horror with heart, we said all the time, was a phrase. And, and I think that's just really important to understand that because that's what I came from, you know, and I'd watch Monster Vision, you know, with Joe Bob. And, and that was also, by the way, one of the places where I saw horror films because... I could, we had TNT, you know, that was the closest. Um, and then I had, I had uh, summer school on VHS and I would watch that summer school, like horror moment where they all do the whole crazy thing. I actually just posted about that recently, like on my social channels, because it meant so much to me as a kid to see this like crazy moment in this Carl Reiner film, you know? Um, but, uh, but look, all of this kind of came back to the fact that everybody told me I couldn't watch it. Everybody told me it was beneath me. Everybody said it wasn't really this as a film lover, as a cinephile that it made me want it and love it even more. And, and then Scare Package became this kind of like culmination of that, of like, let's just have fun. Let's just do this way we want to do it. I'm going to make it the way that I remember thinking I should make movies when I was a kid. And, uh, and then hopefully people are just laughing and having a goofy ass time, you know? So let's get to Scare Package. Um, I told you off the air, but I went into Scare Package. I watched it on the Joe Bob Briggs show. I went in with tempered expectations. I've seen a lot of direct to video projects over the years, and we probably both can agree that, you know, some, some are better than others, but you always go in with a little bit different of expectations. And within two minutes, you just absolutely were, were just hitting on all cylinders and just rocking. And while I think certain episodes are better than others, I don't think any of them failed. 
and, and that's really rare for an anthology, let alone an anthology as ambitious to do it. The number of stories and the complexity of some of the interrelations of the stories, the only thing to compare it with is Trick or Treat, but that's a completely different animal too because that's a different sort of love letter. It's it's more, I don't know, but that's more a love letter to the John Landis's and the... Um, yeah, the fantastical, you know. You know yeah. yeah. What Mike did on that is just ugh, amazing, yeah. Yeah, so... Tell me, like, when did Scare Package, because you are the creator, so where did Scare Package come yeah. from, and how did you get this thing, I mean, obviously through your production company, but how did you get this thing rolling? Because it doesn't seem on the outside to be an elevator pitch to me. No, I didn't pitch it to a damn person, because I pitched it to myself, because I knew I was going to make it, and I was going to get it made, you know, that's that's how, that's all this was. Uh, so look, coming off of Camera Obscura, which was a really difficult film to make, I'm proud of what that movie is, but... We made that with the studio, uh, with Universal. I'm look, don't get me wrong, the fucking Jerry Goldsmith, like you know, logo, Universal logo comes before my movie, and I get chills, and that's really cool, and I hear that score. But uh, it was a very difficult process, and the movie that came out as a result of that was not the movie that I wanted it to be. I mean, in fact, if you were to go like watch it, it's on like the Oprah Network or some bullshit that NBC Universal puts out on now. But it's not even the cut. It's like some 88 minute like bastardized cut of like what I had. And uh, cut the gore down and cut some of the sex down. And no, there's a lot of sex. There's a couple minutes. But I uh, cut stuff out of it. And I'm like, this is just not my movie. And it was frustrating. And also the movie is just a downer. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> depressing when you're over, uh, when you finish. And I would do Q&As after and I get up on stage. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, everyone. Like, you know, I know I just depressed you for the evening. Um, I, but I love bat down endings. <laughs> I mean, Alien 3 yeah. is one of my favorite films. So. Alien 3 is a blast. David Fincher's, yeah. Like there, there's a great analysis of why Fincher still did something amazing in Alien 3 despite all the studio intervention that happened there. And also he's the perfect example too of like, if you get the fuck out of the way of a really good director, what they can do when they have full freedom. And that's why Fincher is the Fincher that we know now. Um, but uh, but anyway, so we had made that and we just wanted to make something with our friends. I wanted to do something that was fun. I wanted to do something that was entertaining. So I knew I wanted to go come more upbeat. And my producing partner, Cameron Burns, who's one of the co-creators of, of uh, Scare Package, he was like, Aaron, let's do an anthology. You know, I'm like, fuck no, I'm not doing an anthology. Like there's so many anthologies that are out there. And I have friends who have made VHS and Southbound and Holidays and ABCs of Death and all this stuff. And they were very successful and they were all kind of hit or miss. Some were amazing. VHS 2, I think is amazing. Southbound is amazing. Um, I like Southbound a lot. Yeah, a lot. yeah. So, oh, Southbound so cool. Talk about one that's a really clever way of tying it together. And I'll talk about that because that became influential to me and how they how they did that. But, um, you know, but really we had, we had made a bunch of short films before we made our first feature and we toured with festivals all over the place. And so as we were touring, I met all these amazing filmmakers that were just making short films. And I was like, man, they're really good at making these fucking short films. Like they're, they're awesome at this. And, and then I looked at ABC's of Death and there's like big directors on that and they were phoning it in and they didn't care. And I know they didn't. I've had directors personally tell me that they didn't care, you know? So, so I know that was the case, even though there's plenty of fun to be had in that movie. And I'm not saying anything negative. Just, there just were, you could see the people who really like went all out, you know, and the ones who maybe did not care. Um, and uh, so anyway, he was pitching me this and I was like, look, if we're going to do it, it's got to be unique. There's got to be a way it's, I, I've got to figure this out. So I'm a little uh, OCD type A, whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, and <laughs> I, I went and watched every anthology that I possibly could. And I made like a little graph of uh, the pluses and minuses and all of them and what like worked for me and what didn't work. And uh, kind of figured out this like almost matrix of exactly what I thought an anthology could be. And one of the hooks that I realized early on was that I love the comedy segments. I always had such a blast, but then there'd be this weird like up and down kind of thing that would happen where you get this really, really, it was a cool segment, but it's super fucking dark. It's in your face. It's like, you know, violent, all this. Um, and then and then you get back to a wraparound story that you didn't care about. And you're like, just give me the next segment. And then the next segment was like this over the top comedy. And I'm like, whoa, this is jarring for me. And this is as someone who likes all of those pieces individually, but together it made for kind of a mess. So, I, you know, I was like, look, let's just do this different. Let's make the anthology that kind of makes fun of anthologies, but also loves them at the same time. And then let's do something that's all horror comedy. Let's hire mainly like short film directors or people that have, you know, that haven't done a bunch of features and stuff so that they're not slumming it with us to do this. Like this is a great opportunity for them. So they want to go all out. 
And I'm a big believer in that. I'm a big believer in finding people that are like, you know, hey, you've done this and this, now let's give you this, you know, and work our way up in the, uh, the ladder. Because that's what I was doing, you know, in the same, the same way. And I respect that. So once we had that hooked together, and I, and I had the idea of how to make the wraparound really feel like one cohesive story, I got excited about it. And the first title of it was Tropes. That's what we called it. But, uh, but then I realized that and every segment would just be a different horror trip. And I'm like, that's unique. Like, I haven't seen anything done quite like that before. But then there's like, well, if the, you know, if the movie's about tropes and the title needs to be a trope. So I was thinking of Silent Night, Deadly Night and Chopping Mall and, you know, Student Bodies and stuff like that. I was like, okay, well, then we need to have like a pun title. So we came up with Scare Package. And then the poster became a trope. And, and then we just fucking went at it. <laughs> Never really relented uh, at any point. And even in our marketing right now, we're still not relenting in the weird tropey stuff that I like to do. If trope is a word, but. Trope is definitely a word. A tropey, but sure, I can conjugate it weirdly, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the cover art, I mean, obviously you're kind of playing off of house. Yeah. Ding dong, you're dead. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But at the I same time, what I, what I kind of really love is not actually that image, it's the rest of it, um, that each of the stories has their own VHS tape and all the little intricacies of the different companies releasing every tape. Yeah. It really feels like someone who, frankly, gives a shit, who, oh, who walk the walk and talk the talk. And I, that's what I love. Also, that tagline about seven, zero working cell phones, Yeah, that's the biggest trope of them all. My yeah. modern cinema and yeah. the fact that you call it out right there, amazing. I was proud. Uh, so yeah, I'm proud of that. I came up with the tagline, came up with the poster idea, all of that, and uh, worked a little bit with one of my producer partners, Chris Phipps. And our original idea was going to be kind of like watching a TV in some kind of like basement setting with tapes kind of hanging around. And I was like, no, we're going to do this at a VHS store. Let's do it in a store. And I knew I wanted the high, the house kind of iconography, but I also our first design of it. It was like we had the tapes and I was like, well, what's the main tape? You know, and then it was like, oh, well, we can make that be the main story, like Rad Chat's whole Emporium or whatever. And I was like, well, yeah, but now if you look at the at the movie poster, you don't, yes, you get a, an idea for the homages. Yes, you get an idea that we, we know our horror, you know, we're, we put little touches in there. And yes, it's a little clever, but how do you know it's a comedy, right? So the tagline was one, but then I was like, that's not enough. Like I need people to know that like, this is also meta and it's self-referential. So then what really, kind of me, and I'm still so proud of it, is uh, just the idea of the, the poster within the poster within the poster. So then it's like, we're the, you know, we're commenting on all of this stuff. And then once I saw it, I mean, I, I think I screamed, like when I first saw the poster, Mark Mark Schoenbach, Sadist Designs, Mark Schoenbach, Sadist Designs, cannot say him enough. He's fucking amazing. And once I saw it, I just lost my shit. And now, now everything is just, man, I really hope people think the movie's half as good as the art. You know, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's fucking so good. It is. And you talked about wraparound story. Mm -hmm. Wraparound stories are infamous for, for kind of being bungled in these things. Even the ones we like tend to not be great. Like the Twilight yeah. Zone wraparound. It's great. It's iconic. But if we're being honest, it's probably the worst thing about the movie. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, probably. <laughs> but, but in the case of Scare Package, I think the wraparounds, plural, mm -hmm. are are so wonderfully crafted that you almost want more of that. You want those characters to have their own actual installment. Oh, that's cool. And that's I think that's the biggest compliment I could give is that it's rather than being an afterthought to just get to the shorts, yeah. it's it's really a strong piece on its own. Oh, that that means that means so much because that was that was what was important to us. Like I just didn't. Like I said, when I made that that matrix of like the things that I liked and didn't, I just didn't want you to be like, oh, just give me to the next story, you know, like maybe have some fun. And it didn't have to be anything huge. Sometimes we did need to move it fast. And we shot a lot more of that wraparound that we, we cut down because the movie's already too long. I couldn't really acknowledge that. And, and so, you know, but it's hard. Anthologies are hard to keep a particular length, by the way, for everybody that has comments on that. It's hard to do. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was fun, uh, to do that. And, and one of the goals or one of the rules really that we had was that this had to be, if you just watched the wraparound from the start all the way through the finish, that this could be one cohesive movie in itself. Like, and if you just watch that, would that be entertaining? And that's, that's kind of like, I mean, as a writer yourself, like, you know, this, like sometimes if you're writing a comedy or you're writing a, you know, a horror film or whatever, you want to remove, remove those genre elements and then say, is this story still engaging? 
right? Mm -hmm. So if you're writing a comedy, if you remove all the comedy, do I still care about the characters? Do I still care about the drama? Are we have our inciting incident? How is that stuff moving forward? So this was, even though this is no like, you know, I'm look, I'm a writer. Like it wasn't like a heavy, we had fun writing the tropey stuff, you know, but it wasn't like I was really trying to hit particular beats and, you know, the hero's journey and shit. Um, but, uh, but it was still that I wanted it to be a fun exploration to kind of go on during that, that time period that you, you felt that story happening. And um, yeah, I'm glad that it, that it works or for some people at least. For the record, no one ever wants to read a comedy by me, but the, the two, but horror and comedy do operate very similarly as far as structure, uh, as far as setup, and then payoff. Yep. And yep. but the but what to underscore what you just said, the best comedy doesn't rely on it though. So yes. you take the punchline out of any George Carlin joke, you still have a captivating twenty minutes leading yes. up. Yes. Well, and you also don't know. You might not even really really good comedy in this. You don't even realize the setup. Right? You don't realize that you're getting a setup. It's not like I'm telling you a joke and here's the beginning of my joke. You're talking, you're giving them another story. And then at the end, you realize the beginning of that story was a joke. And that's when it's really clever. Like, and I think, not that I, I hate to say something's really clever and then reference something we did, but we try to layer things in like that. Where like, even at the very beginning, there's references to, you know, Rad Chad and he's like, oh, like, I don't remember my father. I never met my father. It's like, okay, that's just an awkward moment. Maybe kind of funny, whatever, but it's not that. But then you realize, no, that's setting up stuff for later, you know? And when uh, John Michael Simpson, who plays Mike Myers and, and Emily Hagen's Cold Open, uh, you know, he's like, oh, I just want to make it to the end and rescue the good guy, or whatever, and all this. And like, okay, like that's setting something up, you know? And, and at the time, it's just like, oh, that's a nice line. You don't think about it. But then it becomes funnier when you actually hit the punchline. And I think that's when it's effectively done. Yeah. And jarring in the right way. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah oh, no, it... it it plays. I'm telling you, both as just a film fan and as a writer, it all worked. It, I, I, I don't mean this any other way, but I didn't do my full do, due diligence into your back catalog when I invited you. Oh, I mean, that's that's fine. I, I this no, it was this film said I want this guy. I want this oh, guy cool. on the show. Oh, cool. Because yeah. because of scare packs, and then I went back and I saw some of the stuff you done before. and went, oh my god. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Um. I have a couple of questions from the chat that I'm going to throw in here. Oh, uh, yeah. So there's people yeah. actually paying attention. That's good. Um, uh, yeah. And then there's a few that aren't, but, but they're drinking. So you understand. Cool. I, I'm jealous. Yeah. DJ Donnelly says, question for Aaron. Why do writers and producers no longer want blue character, blue collar characters that you can relate to in films anymore? And do you think it's, it is time to bring back those type of people again? I think what he's talking about is that yeah. we never see people in their daily life doing things that everyone else does in their daily life anymore it's, it's always that trope that no one ever has to work anymore in a film yeah i mean i think there's there is a little something to because a lot of times you're taught to like write these interesting characters that people don't know they can speak to something unique so i think that might be like a film school problem right because i know that it's like well people know what it's like to see a mailman or people know what it's like to see i don't know an accountant or whatever it is like they see those in their day li daily lives that's boring you need to give them this really interesting backstory to keep you engaged. I mean, that's obviously not true. You don't have to do that. It doesn't really matter what their job is as long as it pertains back into what's going on. Um, I mean, just the other night, I watched Mausoleum with a friend of mine, and uh, it was, you know, in that movie, the the husband, like, has, I have no idea what his job is. I have no clue what that guy <laughs> is. I have no fucking clue what's going on, and I don't care, you know, because of that. But I think there was an opportunity there to kind of, like, explore like something with him to create that, that part of his job could have had a dynamic that, that fights against his wife and like what this transformation she's going through. I think there's opportunities there to do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I really do think it's probably a product of film school, you know, just saying you have your characters to be so interesting and do these weird, wild things um, that uh, it starts to kind of go by the wayside. But I will say, I, I also kind of fall victim to that sometimes because I like exploring you know, people who have interesting quirks, you know, and learning something new about them. And that, if you can tell the audience something new about someone, I think that also becomes like an interesting thing to explore. Yeah, my, my thing is just always that we need a lot more John McClane's. They can be really interesting characters, but they can also have their feet cut to shreds by glass by the end. That's a great, that's a, that's a really, really great way of putting it too, because Die Hard is probably the perfect example. But also keep in mind, it's just so expertly written yeah. that I think, I don't think, you know, if you're not, 
look, if you don't have the ability to write fucking Die Hard, then <laughs> maybe you probably need to do everything you can. Like me, I can't write Die Hard. Dear God, I wish I could write Die Hard. So I'm going to have to put a lot of weird shit in my characters to make it interesting to you because I cannot, I cannot create that kind of, you know, uh, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> so so that's, that's interesting in itself. And Lost Cunningham has probably the toughest question you're ever going to be asked about yeah. Scarab Package. And that is, should I watch it on its own or the Joe Bob cut? I mean, look, if you're a diehard Joe Bob fan, you should watch the Joe Bob cut, you know, because he's funny, you know. And um, I will say I have a thread on Twitter that I just put on recently that you can follow. And uh, you can see me kind of making fun of Joe Bob back with some stuff that he tried to throw out there. Because, uh, But look, John, John Blue, Joe Bob, amazing, amazing person. Uh, probably kind of call him a friend uh, now. And he, uh, we had a lot of fun doing that stuff. But uh, but the fact that he watched Courtney and, Hill Courtney and um, Hillary Andahar's Girls Line Out of Body segment, and he's like, oh, I don't know, what, what tropes are these? And I'm like, have you not seen Blood and Black Lace, Joe Bob? Mm -hmm. Have you not seen Deep Red? Like, do you not know Jalo Films? The Faceless Killer, the Haunted Object, the Slumber Parties, like, there's just tropes all over the place in that, in that segment. Um, but it's meant to be a different kind of humor, too. Um, I mean, even, they were, they were so... The, the nuance they had in that and like what they did. They even got these vintage lenses. So it kind of like the focus shifts a little bit as you're watching it. And that's because that's what happened in those movies. It's exactly how those looked. So those little details like matter. I'm like, come on, John, you got to get this. You should know this. But um, yeah, I mean, actually, you know what? I have a better answer. Watch both. That's a great answer. And buy the physical media when available. Yes, um, Thank you. So yeah, that segment in particular, and I know you didn't direct it, but I mean, you're still producer. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, narratively, I don't know what it reminded me of, but I know that in looks, that thing looks like it was directed by Sergio Martino. With yeah, all yeah. those colors and the camera motion and just the, the fetishism on absolutely everything. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, amazing. Well, they love Giallo, you know, I mean, like, I think- Makes sense. Well, even though Argento's on a slate Giallo, so just know I understand the difference. But um, they, you know, Argento's like one of, I think it's Hillary's like favorite of all time filmmakers. Um, but yeah, they just- they just have like, they're, they're also production designers. They're some of the best production designers in any horror like on the planet. So that's part of the reason why they're production. I, I tried to hire them for the Pale Door, but they're like doing Blumhouse movies and stuff now. They're so so big. Well, you know, where's their priorities? Come on. Yeah, let's go, what's going on? Yeah, for yeah, Western. Uh, come on. Yeah, that's okay. They did the Take win, me. which was good too. The production so, so because you brought it up, I have to ask it. One of the central questions, ask any horror fan. Argento or Fulci? Argento. Okay, we're on opposite sides of that coin, but that's okay. 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 I can I can respect that. It's 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 not don't get me wrong. I I love full, don't I mean that's like even I start to think about it and I start to kind of like waver a little back and forth on this. So that's that's tricky. But my first inclination is Argento. Um so just and I think it's mainly just because of Suspiria. You know, like Suspiria is just such a it's just a seminal film for me and that's so much. I even love the remake as well, even though it's a very different version of that. Um so that's just a, such an influential film that is on a higher plane than anything else. And that's that's why that would have to happen. Have you checked out the UHD of it yet? No, because I'm living in like in between no, places right. right now. And I don't have my, I don't even have a, this is going to sound sacrilege. I don't have a Blu-ray player where I'm at right now and it's driving me mad. And uh, so I'm, cause it's all in storage and I'm in between houses and craziness. But no, I I, I want to though, I want to. I want, and the new Jaws came out. I don't even have that yet. That's, that's like criminal for me. I, I'm I'm just in such a weird place about that release, the Jaws release, because I've bought Jaws so many times at this point. Yeah, I have like five. Yeah, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I should stop myself. I, I don't know. You can stop. Don't worry. I, I'll keep it going for you, okay. so it'll happen. I mean, I can't help it. So I mean, that's a that's another one of my crazy opinions. Uh, Jaws is the best film in his franchise, but obviously. But I'm a Jaws two mark. I'm I'm the Jaws two guy. I'm going to watch one of those movies. To, it's the second film. It's it's the slasher film on the open sea. That's. The I mean, film. look, I I like Jaws too. I'm fine with it, but uh, I mean, like, it's not even in the ballpark, Lauren of Jaws. But yes, yes, it absolutely isn't. But if you want, which one I'm gonna have more fun watching it? A drop of a hat. And again, I I saw Jaws two weeks ago at a drive-in. I'm yeah. I'm a fan. There's no question. But yeah. if you ask me, which one I'm more likely you're more likely to walk into my living room and see playing? Oh yeah, it's it's it's. It's well, Jaws too, because you still get Roy Scheider, you still get all this great acting, but you also get all the slimy, stupid exploitation stuff that I love. 
I do look once they're on the raft and they're kind of getting to that rock island mm-hmm. and everything. I think that's pretty rad. Like, don't get me wrong, I think it's really great. And then when the one boat comes and it's like, and then the, and the shark gets them there, it's nice. Uh, the bar thing is kind of cheesy, but look, I uh, but drop a hat. We're gonna drop a lot of fucking hats because it's Jaws the first one every <laughs> time. And and I mean, I'm completely and totally obsessed. I have a Jaws tattoo. Some hard to see. Like, I mean, it's it's the movie for me um, of all time. Like, that's not even. That's my favorite film of all time, like ever, ever, no question about it. And uh, is the only movie that as a kid was one of my favorite movies. And then I grew up and somehow the movie's better now than when I was a kid. <laughs> and I don't know how that's possible, but uh, that's just the magic of like Spielberg at his peak. Uh, I see now Jeff Bradley just joined us in the chat and uh, fellow writer Jeff Bradley, who now is trying to bait me into talking about aliens and it's not going to happen. Hey, Jeff, just just know we talked about this beforehand. Lauren's ridiculous that he thinks that aliens is not some amazing film. We don't have to get into it right now, but you speak truth. And I don't know what's going on. Had I known that this person interviewing me was going to bad talk aliens, everything would have changed. I'd be like, you know, eating cereal, watching a movie or something. The fuck? <sighs> you see, yeah. Jeff comes in here and derails the whole thing. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I just mentioned drive-ins because I did go see uh, Jaws at the drive-in. I saw Jaws and in Jurassic Park two weeks ago. And I saw th- this last week, I went to the back to the drive-in and saw Raiders of the Lost Ark with a new horror film called uh, The Relic, which yep. is not the 1993 monster film. And yep. it is amazing. It is an amazing. Yeah, I saw an early cut of it as well. I saw it a couple oh, yeah. So good. So yeah, good. It's, it's really good. Very much. It, you have to be kind of in the mood for the lodge and that kind of like brooding kind of horror, you know, that's, that's, that's building, but it's just, there's so much tension. And uh, I can't remember her name. She's amazing though. I'm really, really excited to see what she does next. Natalie. Yeah. Natalie James. James. Yeah. Yeah, She's phenomenal. I want to know her. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Australian though. So you have to do some travel, I think. That's fine. Hey, Australia also has the best actors. So there's so many Uh, good, I'm always hiring actors from Australia. So there you go. Well, they, that is it. But my question really was more along the lines of uh, the drive-ins during this period have really gotten a second life. And what's interesting yeah. is independent horror films have really managed to get a foothold in that new life. It's, uh, Lord, this is huge. So so nobody's really talking about this right now. Um, so The Pale Door, which is my next, it's a horror western that I made with, with Joe R. Lansdale and uh, easily the most ambitious film I've ever made, most personal film I've ever made. And uh, just a really, really big deal to me. And I'm so nervous for it to come out. But it's coming out in August here. And, uh, you know, we were going to play some big festivals and stuff. And we had some great opportunities. But uh, once we saw, you know, we don't know what's happening with those festivals due to COVID. We don't know how the world's really going to work with this. And then, um, so my buddies, uh, the Pierce Brothers, they made a movie called The Wretched, which has now made over $2 million at the drive-in. And at drive-ins, just playing drive-ins. And then Mm -hmm. Becky's done really well and a few others. So there's a model that's there. My distributors, RLJE, who put out like Mandy, Call Out of Space, stuff like that. And we've been talking about it. And we're like, look, just fuck it. Let's just put this out in, in, in August. If there are some theaters open, we'll do some socially distanced theaters. But like, let's push it in drive-ins and on VOD and have fun with it. And I'm so excited about it. And I believe like Joe Bob was prophetic, right? Like they're never going to die. And I don't think they're going to die. I think that this is getting people... Look, I like seeing movies where I don't have to deal with annoying people next to me. I want the person that I'm with or people that I'm with there. But then beyond that, I'd rather get these other people the fuck out of there. So the idea, because who knows if they're talking or whatever they're doing, and I just don't want that. But uh, you can get you know four people in your car or you know your your you know your partner in a car. Like that's cool. That's a cool thing. And I really really hope that and I believe. That uh, And I just was on a, a phone call with a distributor and a sales agent, and we were talking about the future of this. And I was like, look, I think there's something here. I think it's going to continue to to grow. It won't be as big as it is right now because there's nothing else going on. So you kind of right. have to go see a movie. But I think, it should, I think it should exist. And I think there should be a viable model specifically for indie horror because studio films can't release on these drive-ins. That's the thing. Like the logistics of doing this, because they're trying to do it. They know there's money. It won't happen. It costs them too much money for the little money they'll make off drive-ins. But for a, a, you know smaller films like what I make, I, this could be a godsend. Like this could be a godsend, and um, I'm so 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 excited about it. Stoked, and if all goes well, I'll probably, assuming it's not unsafe, 
but I'll be traveling, like driving to drive in, um, you know, signing posters and, you know, whatever, handing out, you know, bandanas with bandanas in the movie as like masks and stuff and whatever we got to do um, to promote the movie. But I'm, I'm really excited for this. Well, know that I'll be there if you can get within a couple states of me. Yeah, um, where are you at? I don't know where you are. Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do think, yeah, they, they, we'll be in New York for sure. And hope we should go to Jersey too. We should. Um, well, there's I'm, not many drive-ins left in Jersey, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. Pennsylvania works as well. We'll, we'll, we'll figure okay. it out. Cool. Um, I, full transparency here because you mentioned Joe R. Lansdale. I, we, Joe and I do share a publisher. The novel's published between him and his daughter are on uh, Cutting Block, Cutting Block oh, Press, cool. and so am I. So just don't want someone calling it out. There's no conflict of interest there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I think, the, I think the drive-in is definitely part of it, but I think streaming for all the crap it gets among of uh, those of us who love physical media has opened up doors for the independent uh, productions as well. That really was a much tougher climb in years gone by. Yeah. Uh, now your extreme example, I mean, scare package getting on the last drive in had to have been just, how did you take that phone call? Uh, I mean, first off, I was the one making the phone call for the longest time. <laughs> get me on there like you know I'm like come on joke like i was talking to darcy all them and uh but we just didn't you know we didn't know it was going to happen like so keep in mind when i hired joe bob to be on the show or be on the show to be on the, the in the movie this is before shutter this is before like he was the shutter resurgence all this stuff none of this shit had happened none of this stuff was going on i just was a joe bob fan that's all it was and i wanted to write in and, and i even sent the script out to people and they all told me like i don't know if everybody's gonna know who joe bob is and, uh, and then now everybody does clearly, but at the time that was a thing. And I was like, well, I, you know what? I don't care. Cause the real horror fans, like the really diehard ones, they'll get it. And then the ones that don't, they'll like explain it to them and they'll be, oh, that's cool. And then that'll be a thing. And like, that's fine. It could be an anecdote on an IMDB, you know, questionnaire or whatever. Like, that's fine. But then he gets on and he breaks the internet and like all that happens. And, uh, and I was text, I'm like sending messages to him and I'm like, oh my God, what is going on? Like, this is amazing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and I, I, fuck, it's hard, it's hard to like articulate. Okay. And I don't want to get too emotional, but I will just, I mean, seriously, I'll get emotional because that night, so I knew, I knew it was coming. We had finally found out and, and it was like, we were so busy, like trying to deliver finish the pale door that I honestly never had time to kind of like, you know, understand it and like accept that this was happening. It was just day, 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 work, work, work. And I really hadn't had time to reflect on it. And then that Friday, you know, June twelfth. I only a few people I had told because we were really, really, it's really stringent about who can know. You know, they're very good about that. And uh, and then you know, all of a sudden, like it happens, then my Twitter, like my phone, Twitter application breaks, actually shuts down in the middle of it because so many people are like, what the fuck is going on? You know, because everybody knew it was coming out the next week, and uh, I, it was it was like surreal. And then when I heard him say my name. I was like, oh my God, like, what is going on? And <laughs> it's weird. I directed him, you know, like I've hung out with him, <laughs> like all this, but there was this like barrier. And then when that happened, I was just like, oh my God, 12 year old Aaron is really <laughs> fucking happy right now. You know, like, I can't believe that I kind of did this. And, um, and I'm still on a high from it. And then when he said, I, and I joked about it, I tweeted about it, I joked, and I was like, look, I, I'm going to cry when he said, that, you know, you know, four stars, Joe Bob says, you know, check it out, whatever. And um, I, I just couldn't, and I did, I mean, I got teary eyed. It was like a whole thing. He nominated, you know, he's like for, you know, uh, last drive in Academy Award or whatever. And I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it, you know, and it was, it was just absolutely surreal. And um, yeah. And, and it's been so great too, to engage with all the Joe Bob fans since then. And just seeing like this rabid fan base to like understand it and get it. And, I, that makes me so happy because, you know, this is all happenstance. Like it wasn't the plan of how that, how that was supposed to happen. You know, like wasn't, this wasn't by design, you know, um, I knew I probably would sell the shutter, but that's prior to that, just because we were making something that uh, Ryan Turk called it uh, a Blumhouse. He called it like inside baseball for horror. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what it is. It's like a lot of jokes, you know, that you, the more, you know, horror, the more you get the jokes, you know, and that kind of stuff. But uh, so I knew shutter was very much on that radar. Um, but uh, yeah, fuck man, it was just—it's—it's it's still crazy. It's like even saying this to you right now is so crazy. So, well, it deserves the exposure. Yeah. J Jamie has a question. Uh, what's your favorite memory from the set? Favorite memory from set? 
Uh, I would have to say, God, there's a couple. There's 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 a few things. I mean, I think when we find, I mean, look, when you know everything Joe about was a lot of fun. I will say that for sure. Uh, when we finally got the treadmill kill to work, which was at the ending, that was pretty amazing because that was so. Look, I am one of the kids that grew up you know, arguing about who would win and fights between Jason and Michael Myers and stuff like that, you know, and, and, uh, and, and so I love, and I love creative kills. In fact, somebody like a gore zone website or something just gave one of the kills that we had, which is when the, we had this guy who was from like uh, American Warrior Ninja or whatever the fuck, who was like flipping, uh, you know, the, the jock dude. And then he, you know, gets his arm broken off and gets stabbed in the head with his own arm. Yeah. And somebody right. put that in their like new top 10 of like all time kills and I wanted to cry. I'm like, oh my God, like this is all I've ever wanted, you know, like <laughs> thank you. But the but I had the idea and I was like, well, how am I gonna kill? I need another really crazy, every kill ought to be crazy. So I was like, I'm gonna kill someone with a treadmill. He's in a treadmill room, he escaped from this room. So he's got this brute strength. Let's just have him throw a treadmill at somebody. And I was like, what? And everybody's like, what? How do you? And I'm like, I'll figure it out. Like, we'll come up with a way to do it. And uh, we, you know, Chris Phipps, again, another producer. Uh, Morgan Fryer, who's like a really great kind of like foreman, construction foreman. We built a wall. So go, that's a real treadmill. We stuck it through the wall. We put green on the bottom um, for uh, Elizabeth True. is a friend of mine. I always kill my friends. That's like a thing that I do. I love to kill my friends. And uh, she's amazing. I love, hi, Elizabeth. You're not watching, but if you were, I miss you. Um, and uh, she was there and we put like green for like the, her feet and her legs. And then, and then reframe the photo, or reframe the image properly. And then had on the other side of the wall, there's people holding because the treadmill is so heavy. And they're like <laughs> kind of holding it with this like barrier thing that we built. And then, and then I actually even rigged it to where the treadmill turns on and moves her torso forward and she falls after. But I thought it was a funnier bit when it just fell. And then, so what's happening there when Brian Lobos, who plays one of the Game of Thrones guards, who's just like holding the, the cup and he's just like chewing all obnoxiously, which is just fucking funny to me. Um, but when he's doing that, we're like waiting for, cause it was a, pra it was a practical leg fall. And um, the top was just fake. Cause again, we had green screened it. And uh, we're just waiting for the bottom of her legs to fall. It's just the weight. And I didn't want to like pull cause it looked unnatural or have wires. So he's just like chewing, you know, just waiting <laughs> for the legs to fall. And we're like, come on legs, fall, fall, <laughs> you know, do it, just do it. And then it, they fell and it looks so great. And then he's just like, hmm, as he's, and I'm like, oh, cut, perfect. Everybody's clapping, you know, it's just like one of those moments um, that was there. And then the second moment would be the Tommy Jarvis gag at the end. That's just like the Corey Feldman makeup thing that I couldn't even direct because I couldn't look at the monitor because I was laughing so hard at Chase Williamson. And I, I could, I mean, I'm not even kidding. That's not a joke. I had to turn around and I called action and then my DP tapped me when we were done and I went back and I watched it on monitor because I ruined take after take after take because I was laughing. So, because <laughs> I couldn't take it. Um, so that was just, that was just fun. But, uh, but yeah, the fact that I killed somebody with a treadmill, it takes, it's, it was way too elaborate for two seconds, but uh, you know, I'm proud of it, so. Yeah, well, you know what? How many second units of those classic slasher films are the reasons we remember? Yeah, yeah, I mean. So. You know, I don't have second units. I don't get no second units. <laughs> well, cool. uh, everywhere, yeah. you know, but I agree with you. Yes, that would have been, that's the thing. Like, you know, but uh, totally, totally. So, Jess Graham is asking about your work in other parts of, in other departments in the film industry. And, you know, just like editing and uh, writing. But mm -hmm. I wanted to point out, though, um, in my research, a couple projects that were from the early part of your career. Um, in sync in the mix, which you were a producer of. You gotta bring and, those up. I gotta bring up the in sync connection. Oh, I, I got. I'm gonna go worse. Oh God. And um, you were an assistant editor on from Justin to Kelly. I was. Actually, not even just that. There's a moment in, and I don't. I, I don't know if it made it in the final cut. I think it's in one of the deleted scenes. I'm actually in Justin to Kelly at one point. <laughs> um, I've never seen it. No, I've, no. I, it I have limits. Record, it holds the record for the fastest turn of like 3000 plus theaters to go straight to video ever made. So I had no idea what's happening. Look, I lived in Florida. I was doing like whatever gigs I could get for any movies. It didn't matter to me. Um, I just wanted to work on film sets. I was happy to work on a film set, you know? And uh, so the in sync thing, 
that's a much bigger story. Uh, so, God, okay. When you graduated from film school in like the early 2000s in Orlando, you and your work, you're looking for work. One of the biggest like purveyors of work was actually Lou Pearlman and all of the NSYNC stuff prior to them, like, you know, having a lawsuit with them and no strings attached and all that bullshit. Um, and so I just did whatever was there. And I worked at Universal Orlando at their production group. And I was an editor for a company called Century 3. And one of the things that I was editing was a, it was all the home video footage that Joey Fatone shot when they went on tour with the Spice Girls. So, so by the way, I know, I've seen everything. I know all the crazy stories. I know all the stuff about, like I had to sign a waiver before the world could know that Lance Bass was gay because they didn't <laughs> want him to know. And they had a, he had a fake relationship with uh, Topanga from Boy Meets World. And, and we all had to like go along with it or whatever. I was at Paris Hilton's opening party in Orlando that was at uh, off Church Street uh, Club Paris. And I was there as a guest of NSYNC. So it's such a weird time of my life that I don't never talk about anymore, but it's a thing. But Joey was a really cool dude, um, Joey Fitzgerald. And he, he used to work at Universal. His dad actually was a teacher at UCF. And uh, he had a company called uh, Fat One Productions, Fatone, clever. And uh, so he, you know, they wanted to make this like, you know, touring video. So I got to know them and then I worked on a couple of music videos and then um, I even helped uh, Lance had a feature called On the Line and I gave him notes on that. I think I'm special thanking that too. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I went to Halloween Horror Nights with, with Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears. It's weird. Like it's weird stuff. Like this was, you know, they're cool people, you know, they're cool dudes, um, you know, and I don't keep in touch with any of them or anything like that, but fucking weird. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, horror director, that's a thing. Um, but, uh, I mean, I wish I kept in touch with Justin. I mean, I hired Justin right now. He'd, he'd get movies okay. for me if I could get him to answer. Anything, oh yeah. So. Just distro becomes an afterthought at that point. Yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah. So there's, there's a lot there. I know you didn't expect any of that coming up. It's all good. Uh, all good. uh so, but what, of the major hats you've worn, whether writing or producing or directing or even the behind the scenes stuff that, you know, I can't probably just research and find out uh, what has been, what is the most fun for you? What would you, if you could do your one job or do you just need to do it all? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's different because that's kind of evolved for me over the years. So I, to me, the first and foremost is writing. Like I love the idea that I can come up with a concept and that, and that, that idea and however it gets to fruition from that point forward, that somewhere, somewhere down the road, some random person that I don't know, is having an emotional reaction to some crazy story that I wanted to tell. And that is profound to me and it means the world to me. And so that is what I, that's my, I'm chasing that all the time, right? Um, so I became a director to protect my writing and I became a producer to protect my directing, right? Um, and, and so it was kind of all derivative and it all started with writing. But what I've learned is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of shady people in uh, independent film, or just in film general, but like really an independent film, there's a lot. And I've learned that I'm good as a producer and, and um, maybe, I don't know if I'm good as a writer or director yet, but I know as a producer, I think I'm good. And I'm good at, at problem solving and I'm good at remaining calm and I'm good at, at, at keeping people motivated and, and getting everybody together on a team. And, and I take a lot of pride in that. And, um, you know, so, so I really enjoy producing. So I'm producing for other people right now. My company is making other films for other folks, and we really like that. Um, I learned a lot by, um, you know, I was, I was lucky to be tangentially tied to Starry Eyes as an executive producer. And um, I learned a lot from Travis Stevens, who's just like an amazing indie horror, you know, producer, and asked him a ton of questions and tried to learn what I could there and apply that and then say, okay, well, here's the stuff I want to do. Here's the stuff I don't want to do. Here's the path I want to make. And so now I feel like my stride is as a producer, but at my heart, it's still like writing, you know? And I'm, I mean, I'm here, I just left, I live in Austin, Texas, but I left to go to the Ozarks to get away because COVID's just like a shit show in Austin right now and nobody cares. And uh, so I had to get away and I went to this like weird loft in the middle of the Ozarks. And uh, so I could write because I have two movies coming out and I had this little gap and I wanted to focus on writing because that's what I, love you know uh, probably more than anything else so yeah i guess it's writing but producing has kind of become this new thing well that's actually really heartening to hear because i believe everything starts with good writing and yeah. i, I want to see you be able to make the biggest impact you can 
because you've shown it. I mean, not just the films in the middle, but if you please check out like everything you've done, there is a level of quality without the money that you might expect from looking at the screen. Um, there's you know, some, there's some things that uh, I will say I'm tied to that aren't great. That's fine. I mean, I did work on from Justin to Kelly. So, you know, they're just putting that out. Well, um, that, that was, like, yeah. <laughs> but what I would say is that, um, too often people either use the horror genre as simply a, t t a stepping stone. And I'm not saying anyone should have to just do horror for that whole career, but mm -hmm. it kind of gets disingenuous at some point for people to make one horror film, get some notice and, you know, never go back to the genre or never even want to acknowledge it. And that's kind of disheartening. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you've stuck with, um, cause you're the real deal. You have a Jason tattoo on your arm, which I, not only do I do, but I'm sure many in the audience. Do. And I also have like, there's Blair Witch. Blair Witch. Yeah, I mean, yeah, look, it's, uh, but I also have a Magnolia tattoo from Paul Thomas Anderson. So like I'm a little all over the place. Um, yeah, I, look, I'm not leaving horror. Like I am, I'm not leaving. Like my company is a genre production outlet. We will, now we'll get a little looser with that. We might do some more like science fiction drama. We might do, you know, I mean, we're doing a horror Western that's coming out soon. We like to do genre mashups. I think that's what's fun for us is this idea of like mixing horror with other genres and, and having unique things to say about them. But uh, I'm not leaving horror. Like, it's fun. I mean, I, I might make some other stuff at some point, but I'm always going to, that will be my through line for everything I do. And I want to talk about Pale Door in a second. Um, Jamie does ask a question that comes up a lot on this channel, more than you would think. Uh, does he like Blair Witch 2? <laughs> so Sam Zimmerman of uh, Shudder is like infamously known for defending Blair Witch 2 all the time. Uh, no, I do not like Blair Witch 2. Uh, I, I, so I, I, you know, full disclosure, like I know those guys, like I know Eduardo and Dan and all them that made Blair Witch. I grew up in, I lived in Orlando for a long time. So that's where they were kind of making those movies. Um, they didn't make that obviously in Orlando, but they they were from that area. So I had some ties to them and, uh, but no, I don't, I don't like Blair Witch. I will say though, I did like the remake and I know some people might not like that, but I did. Um, granted, I also know that filmmaker, Adam Wingard, I went to film school with, but that's not the reason why I like it. Um, I like it because they really, I think him and Simon really like kind of peeled back some of the folklore and, and some of the, the interesting stuff that was like unearthed in the story that originally existed. Um, and I thought that was fun for them to explore. But uh, no, I don't like Blair Witch 2. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I do. So there you go. Oh, see, this this is, this is this makes sense. You don't like Aliens and you like Blair Witch 2. I now understand like how this works. So I get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I yeah. think I think that Blair Witch 2 is an unfortunate casualty of the time it was made. It has some really great ideas, both visually and storytelling wise. And then you look at what the studio wanted from it, and it was something different than what they were trying to make. Well, that could be true, because honestly, I have not revisited that film in a long time. So maybe, I, maybe I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, and I'll do well, that. You know, I'm not saying rush to it, because it's not a hidden masterpiece or anything, but yeah. I think there's a, its reputation is far worse than the film is. Yeah, um, which happens a lot, unfortunately. Again, oh, yeah. when when we have that kind of like same seven sources for all your horror news, and they constantly bash on something, if you didn't initially love something, you probably don't revisit it. You just assume that that's true. That's kind of what we're trying to do here on this channel and other channels. I love that. We're trying to get, like let people just honestly say, no, you know what? I know that no one thinks that Deadly Blessing is the best Wes Craven yeah. film, but I, but I do. Deadly Blessing is fun. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, clearly that person's wrong, but I love that they have that opinion. Right. Sure. I mean, like, look, I think you can find you can find things to like in all these films, you know, and, and, and also now that I've become a filmmaker and I'm doing this, like you start to kind of see how hard it is to make these movies. You just start to appreciate them on a different level because every film is a goddamn miracle. Like, I mean, totally, totally. So there's a uh, there's a lot to be said. there, But yeah. OK. Uh, you know, I'm going to reshuffle one of my questions here just because um I think this is more natural to where we are. Uh, before we go to Pale Door, mm -hmm. so one of the constant conversations on this channel is about the 70s and 80s franchises that continue to this day. Mm -hmm. And I should really probably say limp on through to the today. Yeah. Um, there's starting to be a groundswell, and I'm certainly a, a vocal member of the groundswell, asking, can we please just retire our precious icons so that new ones can arise because as much as I love the Friday the 13th franchise, as much as I love the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm -hmm. at this point, 
continuing them is doing more damage to their brand, I think, than not. And that's not saying there isn't a brilliant filmmaker out there that can buck the trend. Yeah. But in general, we don't need more films in a franchise than there are innings in a baseball game. I, I can see that. I think if you want to have that be the rule, I'm I'm not afraid of that rule. The the one so I will say, I'll preface all of this by saying. David Bruckner is going to absolutely slay Hellraiser that I'll put out there. I know it. I know he will. He's fucking amazing. And I, I love the ritual. And I think if you watch the ritual, you'll get an idea of what he can do. I like the ritual and, a lot. And, and I think, um, you know, and, and even, even the writers too, God, I can't remember their names right now. Um, I know Ben, oh, ben, uh, ben and Luke. Ben and Luke are amazing writers. Like in his new feature that played at uh, Sundance, um, I have not seen that yet, but it's supposed to be amazing. So, I'm really excited for Bruckner to tackle Hellraiser. So I'll preface all this with that. Aside from that, uh, yeah, I think that there's this, look, I think we're kind of stuck. Look, I made a nostalgic film, don't get me wrong, but we're kind of stuck in this, like we just have to do things that are nostalgic and that's it. And there's nothing else that can be said or done about that. And I think that's wrong. Um, I do believe, back to Bruckner, he had a really unique take on how he was gonna remake Friday the 13th before they pulled that out from him. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen there. But before this like becomes a thing, because if in five years somebody lets me make Friday the Thirteenth, I'm fucking making it. So let me just put that out there, and I will give it a hundred and ten percent. I promise. I uh, promise. But I think unless you really have a unique way of pushing this forward, don't treat these things like IP. They're treated like IP. They're not treated like this. There, because there's a story. There's a central arc. There's things that are going on. There's things that we want to kind of see happen. And you can't just recreate what happened. Because if you were to remake Friday the 13th, you know, one, two, or three, four, like that, the, the first four, which are really kind of a succinct, you know, quattro, so to say, um, it, they would not work right now because it's, you've seen it all before. It's kind of clunky and all this. But I, again, I say this as somebody with a tattoo of it. Like I love it <laughs> unapologetically, but it wouldn't work in a modern retelling like that. You've got to have something you need to say with it. You've got to have, and and the problem is, but then when you tell somebody to be unique, they then want to do this like wild spin that's like far too much out there. And it becomes like some weird story about Jason's dad or something. And it's just like, what are we even doing? Um, I mean, every pitch. So for, for years, and I've heard it from multiple filmmakers, I am not fortunate to be able to pitch on a Friday 13th movie, but my friends who have, every single one of them was like, we just want Friday 13th in the snow. That's what every studio was saying. We want Friday 13th in the snow. You know, and I'm like, okay, that's cool. Like seeing Jason in the snow, I think would be rad. But what else? What else happens in the movie yeah, besides snow? What else snow? are you doing? Like, what else are you trying to make happen? And if uh, you can't answer that question, then get the fuck out. I've always said my, my Friday pitch, because, you know, I'll never get the chance to pitch it. It's very simple. You tell the story in reverse. You start with the final girl walking in a daze out of the woods, and you tell the story backwards. Hmm. That way you get all the Friday thrills, but it's something we haven't seen before. Almost a forensic take on Friday the 13th. Yeah, there's something there. There's something that yeah. could happen there. Yeah. I just think you have to you have to take everything that works and not throw it out, but you gotta find a way to frame it differently than we've ever seen it before. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. And by the by the way, because it's one of my bet pet issues, Jason's dad on film is the worst friggin' idea they could ever do for a Friday the thirteenth. Demystifying Jason any more than he's already been demystified is a mistake. Yeah. It was like giving a backstory to Mike Myers. Yep. You know? uh, like, exactly. Oh. He was scary when he was, because he was called, his title was The Face. They called him The Face, right? Like, that's great. Like, that's because you don't know what that is. You don't know what's going on, you know? It's just William Shatter. You don't know what's going on there either. But uh, you don't know what's going on in that mask. And and that's fun and that's scary. But once you start to understand this, like, backstory of abuse and what happened and all this and all that, it just gets convoluted and you lose the the creepiness of it. It's like if you, if you in The Strangers, if they stop in The Strangers, there's a 15-minute, like, here's the history of all the strangers that show up in that movie. It would ruin that movie completely. So it's like, it's just like, come on, like we're getting so, but, but you have to keep in mind too, these happen in a pitch to people who are not horror fans that just know that, right. that Jason's a, this character, right? They couldn't spell Voorhees if you had a gun to their head. And, and so you're trying to figure that out with them. And it's like, uh, yeah, I've seen that before. That's like this and like this. And it's like, well, yeah, but no, that makes no sense. It just becomes this like, because I've, I've been fortunate to pitch on a couple properties, you know, in the past couple of years. And they've been, um, and they've been decent, decent situations. And they haven't been like horrible. But there's always somebody in the room who's just like, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Like, so clearly you have no clue what I'm talking <laughs> about. So, um, 
you know, and that's that's a hard thing to do. You know, that's a hard thing to to reconcile and make happen. So the Pale Door, a yeah. horror western. Um, my understanding is, and there's very little information online about it, which I'm sure is exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so is train robbers get stranded in a town, in an abandoned town with witches? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, a group of uh, gang cowboys led by two brothers, and uh, they rob a train, and, uh, you know, somebody's shot. They have to hold up in a ghost town that's nearby to tend to their wounded leader. Uh, the ghost town has a working brothel. They partake. And uh oh, it's Coven of Witches, and it's a survive the night cowboys and witches kind of story. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's like the the kind of like macro framework. But it's really a very, you know, it's a weird like Western horror action in moments and then drama. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting for people to see. Uh, but it's a very personal film to me. It deals a lot with myself and my brother and my father. And, you know, just reconciling a lot of shit there, you know, and uh, that's what you do. You work through your life. Like I, I write my life out in things like I could. And, it's, and anybody who watches my stuff will clearly see that I have like father issues because it comes up <laughs> with like scare package and it'll come up in this and it came up in camera obscura. And uh, so I write about that because that's what I'm working through, you know, and it's what I can talk about. And I know what that pain's like and I know what it's like to deal with that. And I write about that. And that becomes something that comes out of my work. So this is a very... You know, this one in particular, the Pale Door in particular, is very much that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, we we got to really, really explore. I love doing a witch story. I thought that was just a lot of fun. I wanted to play. I wanted to create my own like version of, a, of witches, which I think is a really cool thing to like have this blank slate and all this folklore that you can play with and all this fun stuff to like take this, but don't take that. And, you know, uh, kind of have my own witches brew, so to say, of that. And I think that's really, really rad. And uh, but then. You know, anyway, I, don't, I can't get away too much, but there's a lot of there's some fun surprises and stuff that are in there. And if you're and if you get the new edition of uh, Fangoria magazine, there's like a spread that I wrote. They asked me, which I was honored to do, um, to write about the movie as well. And I talk about some of that in there. I I, I have not picked up a new issue of the new Fangoria. I, I grew up with it. I own the first hundred issues in bags. Um, yeah. I, I I get worried about the idea of a magazine that's marketed specifically to the nostalgic adult. You know, I'm, I'm, sure. I'll be 40, I'll be 47 in a, a month. Right. Yeah. Monster mags to me should still appeal to 12 and 13 year olds. And with price tag and with a few other things, I just get worried. I don't want horror to lose its base, whether it was like Forey Ackerman's monster kids or the Fangoria generation. I worry the kids today have the internet and that's about it. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, just full disclosure, I haven't read your piece because of that. Oh, now that I know you wrote it, I probably will go out and pick up an issue. I, but yeah, I, I will say I, I really like what they're doing. I think we're well. I mean, look, right now it's all in flux. It's being sold, and all kinds of craziness is happening. We don't need to get into that. But um, but what I will say is like what Phil, Phil Noble, and uh, you know Meredith Borders that are doing that are that are editing that. There's real in-depth film analysis that's happening on horror films in those in those magazines, um, especially in the printed versions. Um, and and I think you get and I know like what I wrote was a very personal piece. You know, there's no puff. You know, that's really happening. There, there's some. There's going to be some stuff, but I mean, for the most part, there's no puff. And I really enjoy that because, yeah, I did read it as a kid. I had to sneak the magazine and hide it under my bed and shit, and you know, and all that. It's so weird. My mom came in and caught me with Fangoria's, not Playboy's. <laughs> Call me with Fangoria's, you know, um, which makes sense because uh, you couldn't find the playbooks. But, but still, <laughs> that was a thing. And yeah, I mean, you know, so it still matters to me. But I think, you know, this group, we've grown up, you know, and I think there are some of us that want that. And I know I do, but I, I get that, though. Like, I do get it, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a thing. But, uh, but yeah, what I wrote uh, in there, I'm, uh, you know, is a weird, vulnerable thing to kind of put out there even before the movie. So we'll see. Well, I think um, given your track record and given how it feels like an original property through and through, which we, again, we desperately need, the more original stories that aren't just simple algebra, you know, you add, subtract this movie from this movie and you end up with this new film. Um, and I, I will say that I think Shutter's done a good job of um, giving access to a lot of the more original stuff out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm thankful for that. But 
I hope Pale Door continues to get a wider and wider exposure to you, for you. I hope that Shutter understand what they have now in you as a creator post scare package, because you know it continues to be hard for the, the small independents to compete with the big guys. Nothing has changed about that. It's just the avenues have changed. Yeah, it's it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really hard. And uh, yeah, and the Pale Door will actually be on Shutter too. It won't be initially in August, it'll just come later, like in um, October. I, I don't know the exact date, but later in the year, it'll be it'll be on, on Shudder as well. But, um, and, I, and, and I think that Shudder, Shudder is really trying to do new and interesting stuff. Uh, look, I'm, I pitch them all the time. I'm like, Shudder, look, just make me your go-to. I'll make movies for you forever. <laughs> you know, I have no problem. I don't need them to be anywhere else. Like, I just want Shudder. Everybody should subscribe to it. Like, I get nothing off you subscribing to it. It's just a good damn deal. And they, they have really great films. And, and I will say, I can tell you, because as somebody who has been behind the scenes with Shudder and I know what's going on, those are real horror fans. They know their horror. They love horror. They love the filmmakers. And they want to to push this stuff. So you all watching those movies when they come out, when that Shudder's original, Shutter, especially a Shudder original, when a Shudder original comes out, just take a second, watch it. I mean, regardless if you like it. If you don't like it, you don't have to say anything. Just like let it go. Because because it matters because like those views matter because if they see what those numbers are, and then those folks that stay involved, they make more Shutter originals. Scare package would not exist had people not watched other Shutter originals prior, you know, or at least wouldn't have been bought by them. Um, and who knows where it would have ended up. But so it looks to be that inside the next six to eight months, uh, uh, Walmart, who are at this point the largest bro brick and mortar seller of physical media, which is scary on its own, yeah. are going to be reducing their amount of in shelf space down to basically an end cap. Uh, so I've heard some of that. What I do know, okay, I don't know, if, I don't know what, who cares if I say this or not, RLJ is going to see this. I don't know. I don't know if they will. They do. Sorry, you didn't tell me I couldn't say it. So we just approved our Walmart shelf space and our cover art and our little display for it for the pale door to have that there. Um, and, then I, and then Scare Package will be there too. So um, not to sound selfish, that's what I know is how I know at least we got in there on the window. So I'll take it for now. Um, but that would be that would still be frustrating because look, even though I, I mean I can't even think of the last time I stuff in the Walmart, but um, well, actually, that's not true. Whenever I go to make a movie and I go to a small town, I have to go to all kinds of Walmarts <laughs> to like survive. Um, so that happens. So when we made the Pell Door in Guthrie, Illinois, I was at Walmart all the goddamn time. But, um, and not that there's anything wrong with that, whatever. I'm not making some statement on Walmarts. But uh, it's, the point is though, there is so much sales that happens at Walmarts. It and is. And you need it. Like indie filmmakers need it because they get a lot of indies that are there. You'd be surprised. Like, mm -hmm. what like, what are there? And, I mean, even if it's just like two copies at all these different Walmarts, that adds up. And, you know, so we need those numbers desperately to continue making these low budget new films. So that would be a real shame if that is actually true. Yeah. It, and unfortunately, it looks like it is. But, you know, the dollar still rules. So what I'm suggesting is everyone needs to go out there and buy the films from brick and mortar. I love Amazon just like everyone else loves Amazon. I make part of my living off of Amazon. But unfortunately, if we want the availability in brick and mortar, you got to get out there and actually buy these where they stock them. And, yeah. you know, Scare Package and Pale Door are going to be there. Um, got to support it when you see it in the flesh, in the wild. Yeah. And I'll, I'll you know, like, or, or you could also buy it from me directly later too. Well, for you yourself. If you need that, that that sounds like the best move of all, but that's yeah. a whole different issue. Yeah, I gotta. I have to buy them to be sell them. It's so weird. Buy my own movie to be selling, but it's fine. I'm not trying to make. Not that I'm trying to make money off it, but like, there's. A, we want to have them to give out to people and stuff like that. And we like to assign them and stuff. But yeah, yes, yes. I mean, it, it goes a long way. Like buy, buying the physical media, actually, is one of the highest margins of money that can go to certain filmmakers. So um, it's really, really great. And if you can't do that or you don't do that or you're living in an apartment the size of a postage stamp and you don't need to fill up any more of the space, stream it because that does matter as well. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we know about them, you know. I mean, look, even if you don't like Scare Package, you can just put it on right now in the background and just let it play. That's fine. I'll take that. I have no, I have no pride when it comes to that. Put it on overnight, you know, whatever you need. I'll send you something Scare Package. Message me and tell me, like, I put Square Package on five times in a row. I will mail you shit. 
for that. <laughs> so you know, I'm not I'm not beyond I'm not beyond buying buying our support. <laughs> so I think uh, all creative people fighting against the uh, corporate world at this point are all in your boat. I know I have a closet full of books that uh, yeah. when people ask, I, I will trudge through and figure out what I still have. Yeah. I mean, when, um, when the stimulus checks came in and I'm fortunate to be in like a, a better financial spot personally. So I, I just, you know, I went and spent my entire stimulus check on other people's work. I was like, if you're an artist, especially in like genre, if you have a book, you have a movie, like whatever it is, send it to me. And uh, you know, and I'll, I'll buy it. Um, and then actually my stimulus check didn't actually come in and I still, it's fine. I saw some, some weird technicality and I didn't get one, but uh, cause I'm freelance, but it's fine. I, I was glad to do it. It's the thought that counts, but uh, yeah, because I think you just have to, you know, supporting, I mean, I, I buy all my friends films, you know, even though I can get links and they can be all, you know, I give notes on movies, but we, you know, I'll still go buy the physical version. I'll still rent it. I'll still do whatever I can because God, it matters. Like it matters to all of us so much. So so James Frost is going to get our last question from the chat, and it is, what is Aaron's overall personal favorite decade in film? Woo. Favorite decade in film. God, that's, that's, that's hard. Um, I, if, uh, <laughs> decade, like, I mean, I can tell you my favorite film of each decade. That's a lot easier for me to do. Uh, I mean, the 70s kind of comes up pretty quickly. You know, I think that's, you know, when I think of, you know, Jaws and Rosemary's Baby and The Godfather and like, you know, I, there's just so much that's there. Um, I really love the 2000s. I will say 2000, 2010. I did actually personally, now not for necessarily horror, but I loved it. Like I love Drive and I love the documentary Exit to the Gift Shop. And I loved, um, you know, so there's, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, actually no, Drive was 2010, to 2000, that was 2012. So I said that doesn't even count. So never mind, that doesn't count. So, um, uh, but although I will say, I think Zodiac came out then. Uh, I love Zodiac. And Zodiac is one of my, that's our, that's probably top 10 at this point for me. Um, so Zodiac is is way, way, way up there. Oh yeah, and The Thing also came out. When I think it was 81. I can't do it. Can I pick a specific 10 years? If I could do oh, that. And like I've never allowed like, people to do that before, but that sounds really like interesting. 74 to 84, I feel like that. That's probably. almost cheating, and I like it a lot. Hey, you said decade. That's true. Decade. I understand so, I mean, what ten is. My traditional answer is the thirties, followed by the seventies. Uh, um, that's a better cinephile answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, now nah, Bride of Frankenstein is my favorite film. I love the yeah, Universal Studios. I love. I mean, I, I for I don't know. The, it was really the Wild West for filmmaking, and they were getting it right, and that's just amazing. Yeah. But, yeah. The Universal Monster era and kind of what happened with that is just like brilliant, wonderful. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, there's some stuff they're trying to do with it. I don't know. I, I thought Invisible Man was good. So we'll see kind of what goes from there. And then Karen Kusama is a, an amazing filmmaker. So she's doing Dracula. That could be interesting. Um, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. There's an amazing script out there right now uh, by a female filmmaker, named Laura Moss. That's kind of a uh, kind of a retelling of Frankenstein. And it's beautiful and haunting and amazing. It just went to the Sundance Labs and they should make it after COVID at some point. Um, but uh, that's one to look out for. And, you know, in two years, I think anybody's going to remember me saying this right now. But when it does finally come out, like, holy shit. Yeah. Well, anything based on the classic Universal era, I will remember because yeah. it's DNA stuff for me. So, uh, Aaron, can you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. Could you ask me what's coming up next on the show? I mean, I suppose I could learn what's happening next on the show. So popular YouTuber Reanimate Her will be on the show on Thursday to talk about her experience in the community. If you haven't uh, checked out her channel, I really suggest it. Also, her website and uh, her podcast. She's all over the, the genre with a very unique, uh, wonderful persona and a wonderful take on the genre. If you like horror hosts of Gears Gone By, you will love her. So it'll be an absolute joy to be able to talk to her for a little while and to share that all with you guys. I'm so, Aaron, uh, 
check her out. And also, Aaron, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, you need to subscribe to my channel. I, I will do that. I'm never on YouTube, so but I will, well, do, I will do that, though. Well, just as I'm going to now put Scare Package on, and, uh, on Shutter whenever I'm not home on repeat. Deal. Uh, your, you could do that for me. Great. I'll put your stuff on repeat. You put Scare Bunch on repeat. Sounds repeat. good to me. Yep. Deal. Um, so how can people keep track of what's going on in, uh, from Paper Street and for your personal projects and uh, what's on the horizon? Yes. Yeah, so I'm easy to find Aaron B. Koontz, uh, you know, and I'm very active on Twitter and Instagram uh, just because I'm always trying to like so much of what we have to do is like, I have to promote the stuff, <laughs> you know, and get it out there. Um, I felt bad in the past month because we had so much great, so many amazing people have come out of the woodwork, including yourself that are trying to help, you know, get the word out on stuff we're doing. So that's really, really cool. Um, so I haven't posted everything that's been going on, but it's so much, but yeah, you can follow me there. Uh, and then paper street pictures is my company. You can follow us uh, on all the you know channels. We've got a podcast, Picture Street Podcast, and all kinds of shit, you know. But like, look, if you just ever want to talk about you know genre films, horror films, you know that kind of stuff, like I'm a complete cinephile. I talk about movies all day, every day for my life, and uh, I love hearing from folks that, that like it. And um, you know, we're we're trying to get stuff going. And then you know, tell Shutter that you like Scare Package, so I can keep making more Scare Package shit because that is actually maybe a possibility if enough people, you know, watch it in the background all the time and like it, you know? So we'll see. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great. And I uh, hope everyone will join me back on Thursday for Reanimate Her at 8 p.m. Thank you much. Have a yep. great rest of your week, guys.